welcome back. And uh, we are moving into our first conversation for today. As I mentioned, it is a very important conversation for us to be having uh, at this time as uh, this is the final days. These are the final days leading up to the referendum to be held in Guatemala. And uh, I have with me this morning uh, retired ambassador James Murphy. And we also have a lecturer at the University of Belize, Cecil Ross. Good morning Good and morning. welcome. Morning. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'm so happy that you are uh, with us this morning because I feel that as the conversation is ongoing and as the information from the Guatemala campaign uh, trickles over into our domain, there are a lot of uh, facts and misinformation that seems to be floating around. So it's such an important time to set uh, the background as much as possible. But I want to start off just kind of, I don't want to miss the opportunity, obviously, Ambassador, to talk about your own involvement in this issue, uh, how long it's been, and, and what you're doing at this time. <coughs> Thank you very much, Melanie. I don't really remember what year it was when I first <laughs> got involved with this issue. Mm -hmm. um, between 96 and 2000, I was ambassador to the OAS mm -hmm. and Washington. And that was right at the time that the facilitation process <coughs> was starting. Um, in 2000, I came home and was posted in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in charge of what was called SORG, Secretariat on Relations with Guatemala. Um, and basically, Part of, I was part of a team that assisted the negotiating team uh, in terms of support, documentation, and so on. Um, then <clears throat> I retired, uh, and from time to time get involved in the issue, most recently with Ambassador Leslie in the referendum unit. Um, so off and on. Off and on. Now, <clears throat> you, you brought up the facilitation process, and I, I think that's a great um, launching point of the conversation. One of the things when uh, one of the one of the things we kept on hearing uh, when we were uh, leading up to the signing of the special agreement and the time after was hearing that this was the last resort of sorts. In other words, everything else. Uh, that is normally done in a peaceful resolution to a dispute had been attempted and failed. And it is important for us to talk about that because where we're facing a referendum that will ultimately decide whether this will be our process, uh, there is a lingering question as to what will potentially happen if Guatemala votes no or if Belize votes no. So um, let's, let's, let's look at the history of what has been done or attempted to be able to resolve this issue? <coughs> well, Belize has participated in negotiations with the British and the Guatemalans mm -hmm. since 1962. Mm -hmm. um, the long history of negotiations shows that it failed basically due to Guatemalan demands mm -hmm. for territory as the price of settlement. No government in Belize is going to sign away Belizean territory. Be that government blue, be that government red, it's just not going to happen. And so the, first, the negotiating process failed. In the mid-60s, there was an attempt at mediation by the United States. The mediator's proposals were rejected by everybody. Uh, <coughs> then, as you pointed out, the facilitation process started in, in, uh, in 2000, and I think it came close to settling this dispute. Uh, most of the facilitators' proposals were quite favorable to Belize, but the Guatemalans eventually killed it um, when they said that they were unable to put the proposals to referendum within the 75 days proposed by 
the two facilitators. Mm -hmm. So the facilitation process failed. So yes, er everything that has been tried has failed. Yeah. So the only thing that's left is the legal option. You know, I find that to be, and I'm sure in the classroom, uh, that's also one of the challenges. To talk about the Belize-Guatemala issue today requires going deep into history. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure, maybe you could give us some insight with the students and maybe with the education process you can let us know, how interested people are in going all the way back or just focusing on the issues uh, that we see in today's world. No, I think they're very interested. I, I find that um, pretty much any discussion, whether in the classroom or outside the classroom, in reference to Belize, Guatemala, people are interested in understanding. Because as you said, um, and, and even beyond what you said, some people are saying, isn't there another option? Isn't there another way rather than, than uh, um, juridical? Because you know, courts are courts. Can we trust? You know? and, 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 and as Ambassador Murphy has said, we have gone back. You go back to the um, 19th century when um, the British and the Guatemalans tried drafting up treaties. So you have had um, ministerial and ambassadorial involvement um, um, with the 1859 Anglo-Guatemalan Treaty. You have had the 1931 exchange of notes. Um, in between the mediation and facilitation, we came close when Jorge Elias Serrano became president and he wanted to definitively put it to rest as such and, and, and negotiated, yeah. one can say, what resulted in the Maritime Areas Act at that point in time, which those of us who were growing up at that point would say for a few months, it was done, it was over, right? And then bam, he's ousted in Guatemala and the case is brought back as such. The, all, all advancement was reversed yeah. as such, no? So there Which is a lot of that, yeah. and, and the students want, and the students need to understand that because we have, by the book, as a country and is a, even as a colony of Britain, gone through all of these processes as such, no? Yeah. But I, I think the call out there, everybody's afraid of court. Mm -hmm. Being an attorney, I understand why. Litigation risk is not necessarily something that you want to face with a, a, a clear heart. Yeah. Uh, it's out of your control. Belize is like control. M my question, though, is in respect to, we've tried all these things, all these options, but have we all tried them in earnest? Because it is political suicide for any politicians, as you said, um, mm -hmm. that if you lose a piece of Belize, <laughs> somehow through negotiations. I mean, that, that would be the end of your life, your family's life. Yeah. Have we tried this in earnest? I want to know, uh, is it that we've played political football with it? It has been a political issue in Guatemala, or sometimes been a political issue in Belize. So when we come to the negotiation table, we're not negotiating. We're trying to save our careers. We're trying to save face. Have we done all of these steps um, in a way that is in good faith? <laughs> well, that's a good one. I, I, I think a negotiated settlement by its very nature will require some compensation. Some, we have to agree to give something. Uh, you can't walk into a negotiating session and say, this is my, these are my demands and I will accept nothing more, nothing less and let's sign. You, ha you have to give and take. Mm -hmm. It has to be. And, and so the question I always ask when we travel the country on these public, this public awareness campaign is uh, what is it that you would have us give to tell us? But Aren't what? there several <laughs> popular phrases? Not a, not a, a blade of grass. Not a blade of grass, blade of, yeah. Uh, grain of sand. Not a grain of sand. That's so, what we hear from Belizeans. So, yeah. so, exactly. So it becomes almost impossible mm -hmm. to achieve a negotiated settlement. Yeah. The Guatemalans over the years have demanded Punta Gorda South, Monkey River South, Ciboon River South, the whole country of Belize. 
Uh, but which government it believes is going to agree to any of those things? The, you know, and I, and I think Kevin brought up a very important point, which allows for great perspective. This issue seems to become more or less prominent based on the administration in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. would, would you agree with that, Ambassador? Well, <coughs> yes, in the sense that uh, some administrations in Guatemala have taken greater interest mm -hmm. in the issue than others. Yeah. Um, as Mr. Ross just said, the, 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 um, the, the, the um, one government in Guatemala, mm -hmm. sorry? One president? One president came very close mm -hmm. to uh, achieving a settlement, mm -hmm. proposing a number of steps which we agreed to, yeah. um, but it, it still boils down to a negotiated settlement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't really, I, I personally don't really see it. Yeah. Now, you know, on, on that same point, if we look at the current presidency of, of Jimmy Morales, you know, oftentimes when the issues uh, become, um, a part of his greatest concern there, there are a number of Guatemalans who call it out for the smoke screen that they see it as, because Guatemala is not without its challenges. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is often believed that when you start speaking about Belize, it's a way to distract mm -hmm. from the major issues that are taking place there. <laughs> yeah, definitely, um, especially during the, the last year, year and a half of yeah. his storm, he has been um, facing a lot of headwind as such in his administration from, from his uh, brother and his son and the corruption <laughs> issue that has given rise and then so many other communities, the indigenous communities um, clamoring in Guatemala City for, 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 for much more mm -hmm. uh, participation, much more power and it's something that um, it's difficult for the current Guatemalan government system and vision as such and so um, it it does allow for 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 this to be as you have mentioned it's sort of a political football mm -hmm. as such no? and and then uh, unfortunately I, I find that the promotion recently in Guatemala is steeped on a lot of misinformation yes. and misconception yes. Yes. you know and, and my students keep sending me yeah, I, I was just seeing and sharing with Ambassador Murphy a, a, a video where um, Guatemala has put out saying you, you, you want to enjoy these uh -huh. white sandy yes. beaches. It's like tourism. Yes. Uh, tourism. Uh, yes. tourism. Then you have to vote yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. White sands, you know, we're Exotic accustomed cases. to only the volcanic sands on the other side. So you want white sands, you have to vote yes, you know. And all, and, and the picture of the blue hole in the in the whole thing there it was which, man, it which brings me to my next concern, which is that it appears that their machinery is better than ours. Their messaging is better than ours, and I can explain what I mean. Their machinery, in terms of, I keep on seeing these things on Facebook. Belizeans keep on hearing these messages, seeing the signage, and their message is is a lot better than ours. Belize says Nuestro. We do not have an equivalent messaging. Is the referendum committee and is the government of Belize, when I say government of Belize, I mean collectively, are we doing enough to deal with the aftermath of it and to prepare people to go into it? Well, I think the, the yes, the Guatemalan PR is, is well advanced, but yeah. that's because they have a referendum on Sunday. Yeah. I think as uh, soon as we set a date for ours, uh, the public awareness campaign will step up and you will see uh, more PR effort on our part. PR of substance though? Because we have an election, general elections slated for 2020 and there's no sexier topic, no more emotional topic <laughs> than to say these guys will give away half of Belize. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that I fully understand what you're saying, but... I'm saying that um, there's no way that any political party, any mass political party, would leave this to be a neutral. They might say publicly, you know, we completely are bipartisan, but this 2020 elections, 
is either about sustaining and continuing life for a three-year term to a fourth, or to get back being four years away. And so no Belizean politician will have propaganda of substance. It must be to win. Yes, but um, my understanding from what I've seen the, the government put out is that uh, our referendum will either be around the end of this year or early. or early next year, which is well in advance of the next general election. Mm -hmm. 29, the end of 2018 or early, or early 2019. 2019. And the general election is 2020. Yes. It's cutting close. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, well, in, in conversation with uh, Minister Ellington on Monday, he did say that, and, and that, of course, it's because they're waiting for the completion of the re-registration exercise. But I, I want to bring it back to, to something um, regarding the, a question we posed earlier. If we, it depends on who you speak to, but there are some who believe that when Belize goes to vote, it'll be a yes vote. Um, there are some who believe that there's no way Belizeans will vote to go to the ICJ. You've both spoken of how we have essentially, like if there was a step-by-step -step process or, or a plan A, plan B, plan C, down to Z contingency, we, we're being told that the ICJ is essentially the last step that you, you go to. What happens if Belize votes no? Well, if either side votes no, then it's no. You can't go to court. To give the ICJ jurisdiction, the two parties have to vote yes. Mm -hmm. So either one of us. So do you then start back from the beginning, go back to facilitation, well, go we'll, back to negotiation? <laughs> well, we'll have to meet with them and decide on the way forward. Mm -hmm. What do we do now? Uh, I think, you know, this, this, refer this referendum was originally scheduled for 2013. Mm -hmm. um, it, and at that time, the, sp the special agreement required simultaneous yes. referendum. <clears throat> I think that if the referendum had been held in 2013, we would have certainly gotten a yes vote. 2013. Yeah. I am less sure now. Um, Why is that? Well, I think... Uh, the Guatemalans have irritated a lot of people um, and people thinking seems to be well we're not going to cooperate with them and they won't go to court we'll make them go to court you can't trust them anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? you can't trust Guatemala you can't trust this. I, so I, I am I'm not saying you won't get a yes vote no all I'm saying is I'm not really sure yeah. How, how do you feel about, you know, the simultaneous referendum? Yeah. The referendum made sense because we are not privy to know what the Guatemalans are going to vote, so we can't be anti their mm -hmm. stance. Um, that's just my perspective on it. You know, the, the, the agreement was amended. They're allowed to do it separately. And I feel almost that our vote will be in staunch opposition as to what Guatemala does. That seems to be based on exactly what Mr. Ross just said. It's almost that we don't trust them, we must be against them. Well, if the Guatemalans get a no vote on Sunday, I don't see any reason for us to have any vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, it's the, the, the court <laughs> option. But they, but they have dead. spoken, and in interviews with the previous foreign minister, they had said, and I believe uh, Minister Ellington reiterated that on Monday, that they're potentially willing to go again to another referendum until they get a yes vote. Whether they'll have the money or they're allowed to is a whole different story, <laughs> but. <laughs> I have heard that also, that they are prepared to have as many referenda as necessary to get a yes yeah. vote. <laughs> uh, that's not my understanding of how democracy works. Uh, if the people say yes, it's yes. If the people say no, it's no. Mm -hmm. But it's an economic football. Because every time they, let's say for example, they were to vote uh, no and we were to vote yes. The international community seems hell-bent on having a settlement. So the friends of Belize and Guatemala would shin up more money again so that the politicians over there, who might not necessarily be the ones above board, can collect more money. It's about the money, even to the referendum stage. So there's some economic benefit from that. But um, my, my question again is, 
as a Belizean sitting down, not as an attorney, because that would cause too much panic for me. But <laughs> is our approach to it? My, I, my problem is with our approach. Somebody dies in the, in the Chikibul area, they call us murderers. Somebody goes across there, we scold our people. That's the way it sounds and appears in the public realm. We go across there and what? We, we go over there. Yeah. And but we go in our territory. Or we go in our territory, and the Guatemalan uh, government calls us all sorts of uh, things. Is there a question internally as to the confidence that we have in the persons? And to me, it has to be a hard conversation. This is the most important decision for you as a Belizean. It, it can change what it means to be a Belizean. Are we going too soft and do the people who are going into these negotiations, are they not taking the right approach because they don't have the confidence within themselves or from the public? It has to be a hard conversation. Yeah. I'll tell you, I've been teaching this course for a number of years, and I've spoken to Ambassador Murphy, to Ambassador Alexis Rosado, to Ambassador Lisa Schumann when she was, to Eamon Courtney. When I look at our team, I think we have, on both sides, some of the best people for our case, as such, for our cause. But it's when it gets to the political director that we see where the problems. Yeah. And, and I, I've listened to even the Guatemalan ambassadors, Rosenthal and Skinner, and, and, and these people, and, and they're, they're people who are serious and committed, and, and I, I would think some of the best people to enter into a discussion, a negotiation, a, a, a process with, no? Do you, do you agree but, that no one is listening to the team beneath the political directorate, as you call it, yeah. in the other Belize or Guatemala? We're listening to our foreign minister, and they're listening to their president. So if you're asking <laughs> them to vote in uh, elections, they listen to the politicians, not the technocrats. You agree? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So how do we move from there? How do we advance the process? How do we move past that disconnect between what the politicians are saying and what the technocrats are saying, the substance at the technocrat level, and the absence of substance at the political directorate level? I, I, am, I am not sure that I would agree that there is absence of substance at the political well, level. A disconnect. Um, I think uh, we have been well represented at the and very competently represented at the political level by both governments. Um, Currently? Over, yes, over the years. I think um, Minister Elrington and CEO Alexis Rosado are both well versed on the subject and very capable of handling the issue. Uh, so I'm not concerned about the political direct. Uh, Mr. Ross calls the political director. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you also have their political director yes. in well, Guatemala. And, yes. and, 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 and this is a hard conversation. Yeah. That's the point at both. And, and, and I think that's what we have seen. We've seen mm -hmm. where the technocrats get together and perhaps start to plot a way forward. but. And we saw that especially in, in, in Guatemala, exactly, more so than exactly. Belize, That's with uh, President Morales taking a very strong stance on things that wasn't and, agreed on. And not being <laughs> comfortable, I, I have to be careful how I say this, <laughs> not being upfront with the truth. Yeah. Right? And, and, and even when it confronts him, he doesn't yeah. embrace it. You see, I find that some of the things that have taken place, and I'll, let, me, let me give specific examples. Let's use the, the chicky bull uh, uh, with the, the child that was shot. When the final information came out, the final report from an independent body, an international organization, the Guatemalans refused to accept it and still called our military forces, murderers. Mm -hmm. If you translate that example 
into what can potentially happen in the ICJ. And we hear this as a concern, valid or not, but a concern of the Belizeans. What, what certainty do we have that if we go to the ICJ and all the legal opinions say this is a solid case, Belize has a solid case, there's no way we're going to lose, as I would expect our lawyers would say. Um, <laughs> and our borders are affirmed internationally. There's no guarantee that Guatemala doesn't do the same thing they did with the OAS report and say, well, we don't agree with it, change the person there. They weren't being fair. It's possible, but I... I would want to, uh, like I do with my students, flesh out the details of that special agreement. Okay. Because it was clear in there that both countries were accepting its definitive, yes. one. Two, that they, after the um, ruling had been made, mm -hmm. that they were both being given six months to name the commission. And if they don't, that the OAS will step in. Was it the OAS or the ICG? The, oh, yes. The OS would step in and name the commission and go through the demarcation in the name of whoever was absent mm -hmm. as such. So by that special agreement, there was no, yeah. they were not going to allow it to just go back yeah. into this back and forth. So it says in the special agreement, uh, accept the decision of the court as final and binding and undertake to comply with and implement it in full and in good, good faith. faith. So that is sufficient for us to well, be convinced. I mean, you, you can't put a gun to the, those people's head nice. and tell them you have to do it. But yes, they, they signed the special agreement just like we did. Yeah. And they have undertaken a com the same commitment mm -hmm. to implement the ruling of the court regardless of what that ruling might, might be. I have read that that in the event of non-compliance -com on the part of the Guatemalans, we have the option of taking the matter to the Security Council mm. of the UN to... Put a gun uh, to their head. Sorry? To put a gun to their head. That's what the <laughs> Security Council does. Well, right? to, 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 to get them to comply. <laughs> oh. Uh, um, so to, to enforce the, the, the ruling. You know, we can't forget, um, it's such a complex issue. I feel like we're barely covering <laughs> this issue right now. But you cannot, and I know my, my good friend Kevin here would love, would love to use the example of a local court, but the challenge is that this is not something taking place, magistrate, Supreme Court, even CCJ. There are international ramifications as independent nations that can be faced. Um, there's financing that uh, is dependent on showing that you are working toward, that we are working towards a solution. How do, we, how do we put that into context for the Belizeans? Because for this public, I should say, because it seems to be a missing portion of the conversation so often. If we use it as a simple agreement or resolution between Kevin and I here in Belize, yeah, it seems like you need to battle it out with me in court, but there are other influences that are so important. Yeah. One, one <laughs> analogy I give my students, one similarity is um, because the ICJ is part of the, the, the whole UN system as yeah. such. And I, I, I have done a lot of indigenous studies, right? That's my special area. Yeah. And I know even much more powerful nations than ours when they have not done what the international courts have required for them, and especially the United Nations, insofar as indigenous rights are concerned as such, the, the, the UN has a way of squeezing them, right? And what it forced New Zealand, what it forced Australia to do as such, to submit you know, a whole percentage to the indigenous people as such, because I, I keep reminding my students that not only is the ICJ part of the United Nations, but so is the World Bank. So is the IMF, which a country like us, you know, we would, I don't know if we'd, what our survival would be without them. But, you know, as I put on my legal hat now, <laughs> they say you never get advice from somebody who does not have to live with the consequences. Somebody who? Does not have to live with the consequences. Okay. 
as Marlene said, there are other factors at play. The World Bank, the ICJ, they don't have to live with the decision that Punta Gorda is gone. They don't have to. And in fact, the converse is that if Punta Gorda is gone, we will fully oblige. It's gone. My question is, are we, I'm going to use a very nasty word, are we lying to the public when we tell them that we have an ironclad case that we're going to win? And let me ask, go further. A win for an attorney means we won the case. But there are degrees of winning. You can win the case and still lose a blade of grass. Mm -hmm. And that would still be considered a win for the international community if we lost 100,000 square acres of land. It would be a win if we retained less than what they claim for. Are we lying to the Belizean people in not defining to them what a win is to let the common man in Belize believe that a win would mean that Guatemala is somehow going away and we're going to give them $20 a month like you're going to courts? Well, speaking only personally, um, I think it's very important to be very upfront and honest with the, with the Belizean people. Um, and if you're asking the question, can we lose? Uh, can we win and still lose? That's my question. I, I am not sure that I can answer that. Can we can win we and win? still lose? Can we get a judgment that says Belize is Belize, but we have to give up so much land and so <clears> much <throat> sea? Well, you would know better than me. You never know what a judge is going to say till he says it. Um, risk. Mm -hmm. So y you, you don't know. All I, all I can tell you is that the legal advice that we have been given is that we have a very strong case and that it is extremely unlikely that we would lose if the ICJ was given jurisdiction. We haven't defined what losing is. Sorry? We have not defined what losing is. I have not heard from any politician technocrat what losing is. When we say we will not lose, we have not told the people what it means. And I go back again. The common belief is that when we say we will not lose, it means we will walk away from this scotch free. Everything intact. Everything intact. Not paying a cent. We're good. The other thing is this. There are two sides to litigation. Clearly Guatemala has legal advice and clearly have been preparing for years. They're not stupid. They're not going to a court thinking, oh, we're going to lose. Let's go to the court to lose. If that were the case, then they would vote no to the referendum. <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you remember, but at the signing of the special agreement at OAS headquarters, 2008, um, there were Belizean journalists present. Yeah. And one journalist asked Gert Rosenthal, who was attending the ceremony, former ambassador to the UN for Guatemala, former foreign minister, for Guatemala. One of the journalists asked Minister Rosenthal, if this thing goes to the ICJ, do you all feel like you all would win? And Rosenthal said, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe most lawyers would tell you, no, we're not going to win. And another journalist picking up on the line of questioning said, nothing. You know, this thing involves land, it involves maritime. We're not going to get any, anything. You all are not going to get anything. And Rosenthal's response was, it is one of these things that is all or nothing, and it would probably be nothing. If he sat on the court, I'd be very happy. But do would you agree with me that he does not sit on the court? And these anecdotal stories does nothing to the substance of actually a court process is involved. It has nothing to do with a reporter outside speaking. The prime minister can speak all he wants. The president can speak all he wants. The power is nowhere there. The power is in the substance of going to court. So as much as I've heard these stories, with all due respect, but they do nothing for me as, a, as an attorney, as somebody who understands legal processes. And worse, for the common man who's thinking, not only have you been saying that and heard it in different places, but you have reneged a couple of times. I don't trust. There's no trust on either side of the border for anyone. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
No, sorry. No, go ahead. Yes. Um, so my question again goes back to this, that let's assume that we are going into this process. Um, aren't there things that we have not done? Because one of the options is, we were speaking about options, yeah. is putting this back in the freezer. And I've heard that articulated, the freezer being put it back on the back shelf for a little while until we've done certain things and caught up. You, you admitted yourself that, we, that their propaganda machine is more advanced, as you put it, than ours. Is there some benefit in saying, listen, you guys, like the cross-country race, you guys are already coming back into Belize City at Hatteville and we're just coming past um, Belmopan. So let's freeze this and see if we can put some political steroids into this and get closer to where you are and try to figure out a couple of things. Personally speaking, no, I don't think uh, deferring the issue would be in our interest. Uh, I think the, the, what we urgently need is legally defined boundaries, borders that are recognized by Guatemala. Um, we, we are losing bits and pieces of Chiqui Bull. Uh, the Guatemalans are treating this, the Sanstuna as an internal river. Um, and I think it is, it is urgent that we get a court ruling uh, defining the border so that we can require Guatemalan recognition. Can I ask one more question? Okay. And excuse me if I seem to be prodding this morning. It's an emotional issue for the, even the most intellectual person out there. I make the analogy between an abuser, because we are facing a bully over there. And you go to court and you get a protection order. You're a nice, frail, bodied female. We are in Belize. Very vulnerable. And we get a court paper and we wave it in front of this bully's face. That paper is, even at best, it won't affect on the ground the problems that we're having. You can't draw a line here, an invisible line. I don't want to call it artificial because I do not agree with that um, designation. But you have this invisible line, which is already established in our constitution. And you have poor people on this side, and you have green grass on that side with mangoes and apples, and with mangoes and custard apple and all of these things, and, 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 and wild animals. And somehow people are going to, because there's a paper, stay on that side. It makes no common sense. And the essence of law is always common sense. Unless the other thing is resources. Even as it stands now, we are unable to properly patrol and man our borders. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the resources to do it. Does a decision come with auxiliary support to get us either education-wise or strategically to put posts or, or, or some other things to help us to keep the integrity of a country, even if we're to win all or nothing, as our good friend said. Does it come, does a judgment come with supporting resources or material to help us to protect and keep our borders, rather than just marking? There's a ruling by the ICJ. Yes, or are there plans in place subsequent to the ruling, if I, it's favorable? I honestly don't know. And the only honest answer I can give you to that is I don't know. Yeah. I think one of the issues there is that I, I've heard a lot of, including my students, who are saying, um, let's call in our friends to help us. Right? <laughs> let's call all of those allies, all of the peace fund contributors, mm -hmm. the members of the UN to help us, who, who voted for our independence and all of that. Uh, and I keep telling them that all of these friends will tell us the same thing. First, let's have a definitive. Right? If they are going to help us, they are going to help us after yeah. something mm. is very definitive. Then they will kick in and they will help put That's in uh, all of this. I, I think that it's a valid point. Uh, friends of Belize are also friends of Guatemala. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And we, we, we can't begin to feel that it's uh, only a support to us, it's a support mm -hmm. to a process of two countries. 
Now, I, I, I'm really interested in finding out, Mr. Ross, because I, I find this issue is emotional for all the lesions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, it is our sovereignty. It is a part of, of what defines who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think similarly as once upon a time, Guatemalans used to be told Belize is a part of theirs, if Belize is a part of Guatemala, we have been told we are not. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not formally in the school system, but we've been knowing it from, from we're children. There's a difference in terms of how we view things based on the different generations. And you are with our young minds in formation, uh, about to enter the working world, in fact, probably first time voters by now. And I, I'm really interested in finding out where they are in terms of what views they have on resolving this issue in this way. Mm -hmm. um, first, one of the things I do want to point out is that years ago, um, a number of historians and history lecturers rewrote for the University of Belize the Intro to Belizean History course. Mm -hmm. to include all of those elements mm -hmm. where we might not be saying in a loud voice um, there's Guatemala has no case, no, no cause for even feeling that they have a case. Mm -hmm. But we have put in all of the um, coverage of the treaties, the concepts of self-determination, um, everything in there so that our students are able to then process that and make the decision because one of the things and that's why when I when people ask me um, do you think we should vote yes or do you think we should vote no I said no 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 don't ask me that question right ask me what all has happened what all what, what are what are the risks what are the things yeah. that's what I want to discuss I don't as an educator want to make you that haven't decision made your decision yet? You have to make it. You haven't personally made your decision I have yet? made my decision personally. <laughs> as okay. as, and would, as you share that would you share that decision <laughs> with us? Wow. <laughs> my students are watching. Oh. And I'm, not I'm only asking. You, you, you <laughs> yes, have I'll, all the history. I'll reserve that <laughs> and, and offer it on a one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. Right, yeah. That's because public. You know, and, I, and I think you know, Kevin, Kevin brought out a very valid point in terms of well, the education campaign has been mm -hmm. primarily in the school systems. And I, and I asked Minister Ellerington whether or not that's perhaps the best place to be because that's not the majority of voters. We don't even know if these, people, these young people are registered to vote as yet. But it is Im important information for them. Mm -hmm. We've seen very minimal education for the wider public. Um, and so it does seem right now that the Guatemalan propaganda is drowning whatever message may be coming out of Belize. We have been told that our education campaign, we've been promised that it'll be ramped up following the vote on Sunday. So we'll wait and see for that. But he's right in saying that the risks have not been communicated. We've been only um, informed of how certain we are in this case if it goes to the ICJ, that we should trust the ICJ process. Mm -hmm. So that is one part of the conversation coming up. But I think a very mis a missing element of the conversation, which uh, Kevin was alluding to a bit earlier, is if we see Belize as being bullied, we want a savior. We want somebody mm -hmm. who will stand up yep. and say, this is unacceptable. You are not allowed to take advantage of the small child, the abused woman. And we have not seen that because, as has been communicated to us, it is a diplomatic issue, yep. and words matter in the, and that's where I said that this cannot be only seen as two countries uh, that are neighbors, there is the international perspective. Mm -hmm. So even with the use, for example, of artificial by Minister Ellington, totally, absolutely, this uh, disgusted all Belizeans mm -hmm. in his mind, it was a mm -hmm. matter of a diplomatic choice to represent what the situation is. So how much does that impact the education process? If we feel we're being continuously taken advantage of and beaten on and beaten on, and there's nobody coming to our savior, coming to save us, but at the same time, you're saying, oh, we should trust the, our abuser. How much does that but, impact? But who is our abuser, Guatemala? 
Well, I will tell you, if, if you are working in the chicky bowl, yes. you would say yes. If you yes. are venturing into the sarstoon, you would say yes. If you are fishermen no, in the sarstoon, you will definitely say if yes. If you ask the average Belizean, I yeah. will say yes. I will be the first to say that Guatemala's treatment mm -hmm. of Belize and Belizeans has not helped yeah. the, the cause for a yes vote. In, on our side of the border. Uh, people are angry and uh, don't wish to associate themselves with anything that the Guatemalans are doing. Um, so I, I will I admit that their, their, that their attitude has caused problems uh, on this side. But it doesn't change the fact that we need a yes vote. We need to settle this thing. We need a legally defined border. Is, is our constitution legal? Because in our constitution, there is a definition. I have to ask this, because this is what people out there are asking. Well, you need there, to ask a lawyer. It, well, <laughs> I, I, I intend to. And we are, apart from me asking a lawyer personally, this is something that affects 375,000 people who have a little right. book. And that little book from we were small told us that our borders are defined. And yeah. it's from this river to that river that we can't go into now. And also that when we became independent, everybody in the world said, listen, this is what you are. You're five foot four and you are Creole Garifuna mix. Now we're going backwards in the mind of the average Belizean. And I mean, I, I, it's a very difficult thing because as Marlene was saying, the persons who 40% of our population is poor. Is what? Poor. Oh, they yes. don't. Yes. They're living below the subsistence line. Yes. Can I go back and say one other thing? That percentage is a dangerous percentage because that percentage is swayed by things other than substance. Anger can be one, political um, affiliation is another, or patronage. Or patronage is another. So when we are talking about this issue and we're, we're educating the school, the school is only 1%, what is it, 1% of persons who start um, at the preschool level get to tertiary level. So are we just pushing to the bourgeoisie? And how does that help us when we have not been doing the groundwork? We want to get, a, as much as Guatemala wants to get a quick come up, to get a piece of something what we call dry come up. They don't put anything in, but they're getting something out. Are we, as a people, as a government administration, trying to dry come up too, without investing the time to get to the highways and the byways, and to get into the minds and hearts of Belizeans, and to convince them that you guys, as leaders, think this is the best decision? Yeah. There, there's two, in, in, in response to what you said, there's two points I want to make. One. Historically, Guatemala won a case against Honduras, embracing the same principle, which now they are contradicting, <laughs> that, the per, that the people who have been there for hundreds of years have developed, have built the roads, have built the towns, have built the cities, deserve the land. Why am I not surprised? Not, not the persons who theoretically, in some Spanish archives, were entitled in the beginning to it. They won that against Honduras. And now they are coming here and, no, no, no. We theoretically supposed to get it so you should surrender it as such as we were. <laughs> but wait, you have already made the case for precedent that who works the land, builds the you know, schools, builds the towns, supposed to get it. Yeah. That's one uh, that I always bring up with my students and that case there that they had with Honduras. The, the, the second thing that, that I find of, of, of importance right here, and, and I make this case with my students, and you are right. At tertiary level, at where I am at, it's only about 4% mm -hmm. of the full population that gets there. And so my issue is every student I come across, and every semester I have hundreds of students, and I tell them, you are not here because of your own merit. You are here because your family is committing to you being here. Your community is committing to you being here. So what you learn here, you have to go back and share. Right? So I would hope that we have this education 
and, and, and this is my hope. I know we have to do more than just hope when it comes to public education, but that we have this, uh, how you call it, arithmetic education where, you know, um, while one in the family gets educated, the whole family um, learns from that education as such, and, and, it, and the village and the community learns from it as such. So I'm hoping that that occurs. And so it's not only that 4% that, that is learning, etc. Can I, can I ask one final hard question? And I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I don't do this, I won't be able to go to my mother's house <laughs> this afternoon, who, who actually, lo actually loves this, 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 um, this topic and my family. But there needs to be a bipartisan approach to this. Mm -hmm. You've spoken about the quality of your team, and there's so many names you call. There are people who I have tremendous respect for. These, these are, for sure, some of the best minds in Belize. I can speak about the lawyers that you call, Alicia Schumann for sure. Um, but one of the things that the team, the second half of the team, the opposition has been calling for is to say, listen, my then referred to disgust um, of Belizean people in terms of some of the statements that have been made. And that's a reality. Anybody who says contrary is either completely aloof or has no interest in understanding the common Belizean man that's going to be voting. None. But one of the things that has been called for by the opposition, and I don't think that they would find any resistance, even from the ruling government and the common Belizean, say, listen, before we do anything else, see the guy who's driving the vehicle? You could please move him to the back. Is that an option, do you think, for the government to say, let's move the current foreign minister? A breath of fresh air. Somebody new. I'm sure he's not the only person in the government, the UDP, who can take this task on, who has competence and knowledge of it, but for the same purpose of the emotional side of it. It's a political game. And in politics, sometimes you, you rinse it out, same old shirt, but you bring and put it in some new uh, old wine and <laughs> new, new skin. <laughs> that, that would help. That would be probably step one. Do you think that the government has the foresight or the sensitivity to even consider <laughs> removing the current foreign minister so that we can have a conversation without the noise of the history and perception that the, some Belizeans have of him. And you don't have to answer it if you don't want. I can put that to my good friend. <laughs> no, Ambassador uh, looks ready to. to. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I was going to do a big dodge. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, that, I, I expected it. <laughs> Sometimes the question as is as diplomat. important. Yeah. Sometimes the question is as important as the response. <laughs> You, you definitely need to direct that to the political I, director. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I do that with my students. There are some topics that I tell them I'm not the best face for delivery. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I would invite Ambassador Murphy to come and talk because there's more credibility mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. when it comes from somebody who has been in the process as such. No? So yeah. I, I'm, I'm and, and in my court in Belize, Guatemala, for instance, when we look at the period of internationalization, I asked um, Ambassador Bobby Leslie, who was there, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and so for all of the negotiating the agreement, the constitutional implications, I bring in the people who, you know, so, so I am comfortable with the idea of sometimes you need to change your face, uh, but I'm not going to call for that. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not calling for that. <laughs> Quite frankly, Minister Ellington has spoken of people calling for, for uh, his uh, removal um, very openly and, and that he has been given the vote of confidence by staying there uh, by as, as by, whom? by his leader. And that was a part of the conversation on Monday. So I, I do want to say this, though. I think... I feel that this is such an important issue. It's hard to always keep it within the context of, because there's, there's the perception, there's the international implications, there's what Guatemala is doing or lying about, you know, mm -hmm. there's what's actually happening on the ground, there's what we do or don't do about what's happening on the ground. But this is essentially a vote for us to move towards it. We can't say what will happen in the courts. We have to vote whether or not we're going to go to the courts. Yep. Guatemala gets to do it first. Belize will by the end of the year or early next year. From your experience, um, both of you, what do you think is, is perhaps the one point that you really hope 
Belizeans will ponder as they begin to make the process mm -hmm. of their decision for the referendum? My, my point, um, I think Belizeans need to realize that we have to stop saying, can we try another way? Because we have tried all of these other ways. Now, whether we're ready for this decision or not is, is, is a question. And it's well, at a certain point, as Ambassador Murphy has said, we will have to bite the bullet and we'll have to get ready as such. Right? And yeah. whatever it takes, whatever we need to do to make sure we are ready yeah. as such. I remember one other diplomat telling me, um, suggesting that maybe we should go to the National Security for uh, an opinion. The security, the security Council. Council. Secu sorry, for the Security Council. <coughs> Give us an opinion on, on the 1859 Treaty, for instance, or the 1931 Exchange of Notes as such. No, because um, one, one thing, and I, and I would think you have looked at, um, is I remember when I first did Belize Guatemala um, course myself as a student, um, it was joint opinion by Boyd and Latapach. Mm -hmm. The first legal opinion. Then there is a subsequent legal opinion that has so many others that, that uh, and, and all would yeah. very versed in, in the ICJ and, and the inner, in, you know. So I am, I don't fear. I honestly, honestly don't think we are in any legal system going to lose any land. As wow. As not a blade of grass, not a green ascent. I don't think we can, uh, but, but that's my opinion, right? There are other things, though, that can, can be affected and can affect us, and will still have ramifications on, on us and, as you, as you pointed out, the Constitution, right? Mm -hmm. That need to be dealt with as such, no? And so I would want us to prepare ourselves for that, uh, so let's, let's, let's get it. We have to close up. Oh. So, <laughs> Ambassador Murphy, your, what you want Belizeans to ponder as they make this decision. What's the alternative? Give me your alternative to the ICJ. That's what I would ask Belizeans to ponder. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. We will have more opportunities to continue this conversation because it is one that we know uh, we want to be able to put forward as much information to the public so they can have a better understanding. Thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about Autism Awareness Month. So stay tuned.